I'm ready? Okay. Yes, I can hear myself. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Member States, we are now starting our test. Please provide us with feedback on the audio and video in preparation for the live stream. Please use our chat, group chat, WhatsApp group chat to provide me with some feedback. I will appreciate this. Testing one, two, testing for audio and video in preparation for the dress. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We are undertaking a test in preparation for the address by the Honorable Chief Justice Janice Emperor DBE. Testing one, two, please provide us with feedback in the group chat. Let, let me know if you are hearing us loud and clear. Whether the video is okay and not jittery, please. Give us some feedback on the quality of audio and video. Testing one, two, testing. Testing. Please provide us with feedback. No background sound. Make sure you hear no background noise. Provide, provide us with some feedback, please. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Nine? Okay. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Grateful for some feedback. Please let us know whether you're hearing us loud and clear. Okay. Thank you, St. Vincent. Getting our first feedback from St. Vincent, hearing us loud and clear. Appreciated. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We are undertaking a test in preparation for the, the address by the Chief Justice to start at 10 o'clock sharp. Member States, please provide us with your feedback. Provide us with some feedback on to how you are hearing us. We'd like to know if you are hearing us loud and clear. The audio is okay. Let us know if you're hearing any background noise affecting the quality of the video and audio. Testing one, two, testing, 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 testing. Well, yeah, I don't think every member state is on as yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing. Again, we continue to undertake a test of the live for live stream. The testing in preparation for the address by the Honorable Chief Justice. Starting less than an hour, we'd want to make sure that all member states are connected and are hearing and seeing us properly. Please provide us with some feedback. It's important for us to know that we are all on way before 10 o'clock. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Continue to test in preparation for the address of the Chief Justice, which is supposed to start in less than an hour. And 
Antigua, thank you very much for the feedback. Testing one, testing one, testing one. Testing one, two, testing one, two. This is a test in preparation for the address by the Honorable Chief Justice. To mark the opening of the law year 2018-2019. I'd be grateful if you can provide us with some feedback. I have not heard from some countries, Grenada, St. Lucia, Dominica, Anguilla. Please provide us with some feedback ASAP. And BVI as well. Well, BVI is there, but they still say it's unavailable. The, 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 the site is unavailable. I don't know if it's from the end. Internet problem. Yeah, so I'm having to refresh. Testing what? Two. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I send the link. The link is in the chat. So, Right, that's how it is. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. As long as we have... Hi, good morning, Magistrate. How are you? <laughs> Mr. Girard wanted... He's done. Mr. Gerard wanted somebody to pray for him. <laughs> I'm sure he can do that for himself. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> testing one, two, testing one, two. Can send them. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We're undertaking a test in preparation for the live stream by the Honorable Chief Justice. Hey, Naja, how are you? Okay, nice. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing one, two, testing. We continue to test in preparation for the live stream by the Honorable Chief Justice. 
Member States, please let us know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Grenada, St. Lucia, Dominica, BVI, Anguilla, Monstrat. Please let us know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Testing one, testing two, testing, testing. We can, we can have some background music again, in, and then we'll go back to the mic. Thanks. That was good. Peter, which, which link are you using? We have a new link for the, it's not the same link for the test, you know that, right? My countries are connecting. I just sent it again. I just sent it again. Or you type in it in. So what form you want to to? By email?
Um, Sorry? Uh, that's what we have. Oh! <laughs> hey, Demetrius, what's up? Does love what? What's that? I cannot hear you properly, huh? My volume is. Oh, okay. Okay, I just told him that the Oh, I don't know. That should well be maybe at one or two. I'm working back on. I'm working back on. The camera is back on. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh boy, you have to be careful, eh? Um, but anyway, he's monitoring. We can have the we can have the mics back to the mics again. Yeah. Testing one, two. Testing, testing. Member states, please let us know if you are hearing us loud and clear. We are doing a test of the mics once again and audio. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. We would like all member states to let us know if they are hearing us loud and clear. St. Vincent, you were on. I think Grenada, we need to know if you are hearing us loud and clear. I think St. Lucia is on. Dominica, we've heard nothing from Dominica. Um, Saint, um, who else? We have BVI, Anguilla, Monstrat. We've heard nothing from Monstrat. Testing one, two, testing one, two. This is a test in preparation for the address by the Honorable Chief Justice, Dame Janice M. Pereira. Address to be given at exactly 10 a.m. today, September 18th. Please let us know that you're hearing us loud and clear. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Let us know if the video is also okay, if you're seeing, seeing me properly at the bench. 
grateful for feedback. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Okay, we are getting feedback from BVI, Anguilla, Antigua, St. Lucia. Thanks very much. Grenada, we need to hear from you. Testing one, two, testing one, two, three, testing, testing, testing. Grenada, please provide us with some feedback. Video is also good from Antigua, so this is good. Thank you very much. Okay, Grenada, thanks very much. Grenada is on. Okay, website feedback is working now, thanks. We have audio in Dominic. We have video in Dominic and no audio. Okay. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We continue to test for the live stream, which is supposed to be given by the Honorable Chief Justice in less than, less than 40 minutes. We want member states to provide us with feedback. Um, we're hearing from Dominica now. I think we've heard from from most member states and Vincent earlier. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, testing. So you have to come and do some tests too, you know. You have to come, BVI is on, yes. I want to say one, two, three, one, two, three. Anguilla is on. No word from Montserrat yet. St. Lucia is on. Montserrat, right. Dominica is on, but they, are, they said they have some audio. Huh? Sorry? Oh, <laughs> Uh, you have to come and help me. <laughs> testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing for audio and video quality. Preparation for the live stream by the Honorable Chief Justice. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We're preparing to have the live stream by the Honorable Chief Justice. Dame Janice M. Pereira, DBE. 
Chief Justice is going to deliver her opening remarks to mark the opening of the law year 2018 to 2019. We want to ensure all member states are on. We need BVI, BVI on. Now I think we need Monstrat on. I think BVI is okay. Monstrat, if you're hearing us, let us know loud and clear. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We continue to test in preparation for the, the presentation by the Honorable Chief Justice. Her remarks to mark the opening of the law year 2018, 2019. You're waiting to her word from Monstrat. Thanks, BVI, you're now seeing your highness loud and clear. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Waiting word from Monstrat, please let us know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing one, two, testing one, two, testing one, two, three, four. Going to test in preparation for the opening of the lawyer, 2018, 2019. Let me know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three.
testing one, two, three. Waiting word from Dominica with the sound issue. Waiting word from Monstrat as well. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. Right.
Okay, all right. Another, okay, okay. Okay, let me check, let me check. Okay. Um, Tony, another sound check from here. Sound check, member states. This is the last sound check. Last sound check, please let us know that you're hearing us loud and clear. Dominica, we need to know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Last sound check, last sound check. Sound and video. Please, all member states, give me an Give me an update once again to let us know that you are hearing us loud and clear. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. We are preparing for the live stream of the Chief Justice's address. Starting in less than 20 minutes. Member States, please let us know that you are hearing us loud and clear. Kim Monstrat, thank you. Yeah, Dominica. Anguilla, thank you. Dominica. Please let us know that you're hearing us loud and clear. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing. We are preparing for life. Live presentation of the Chief Justice's first um, remarks. The remarks by the Janice M. Pereira will be in less than 20 minutes. Okay, thank you, Anderson. Thanks, St. Lucia. Let us know that we are hearing and seeing me properly. Testing one, two, three, testing. Wi-Fi? We can put him on the Wi-Fi here. We have a good Wi-Fi here. Yeah, we have the password. Can you bring the iPad? Okay. Yeah. Testing one, two, three, St. Vincent, yes. There is sound. Dominica, thank you, you are on. There's still an issue with audio. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Tony, our audio is okay? Good. Your audio is going on all right? Yeah? Yeah. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. You want to take a test? Member States, please let us know that you're hearing us loud and clear. Okay, St. Vincent is back on hearing. Okay, nice. Testing one, two, three. We have less than 15 minutes before we go live. We want to make sure everyone is on board. Testing, testing one, two, three, four. Please continue to monitor the, your stream to make sure that there are no issues.
Okay, thank you, Grenada. Nice. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, four. Sound check, sound on the video check. Sound and video check. So they are ready? Sir? You're almost ready, right? Okay. Hmm? Um, Dominica said they're almost. They're almost done? Yeah. So you want to call them? Yes, sir. Testing one, two, testing one, two. We continue to test in preparation for the presentation by an Honorable Chief Justice, Dame Janice M. Pereira. Again, please ensure that your stream is coming on. Okay. Okay, Dominica. Nice.
Member States, one last audio and video test. One last audio and video test. Again, please let us know that your hand is loud and clear. One last audio and video test. Let us know. I'll signal to you when we're about to start. One last, one last audio and video test. I will signal to you when we are ready to start. So one last audio and video test.
Lordship, the Honorable Dave Chinese Pereira, and Justices of Appeal. His Lordship, the Honorable Justice Trevor Ward QP. Her Ladyship, the Honorable Justice Lorraine Williams. And His Lordship, the Honorable Justice Eddie Benson. Honorable Chief Justice, Dame Janice M. Pereira, Honorable Justices of Appeal, Honorable High Court Judges, Honorable Vincent Byron, Attorney General, Senior Magistrate and Magistrates, Mr. Volston Graham, Director of Public Prosecutions, Ms. Simone Bullen Thompson, Solicitor General, Ms. Michelle John Thibbles, Chief Registrar, Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Ms. Janine Harris Lake, Registrar of the High Court. Mr. Thaddeus Antoine, President of the OECS Bar Association. Ms. Delia Rowe Joseph, President of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association. Learned members of the Inner Bar, Learned members of the Otter Bar members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Michael Morton, Honorary Counsel, members of the clergy, Mr. Ian Queeley, Commissioner of Police, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Cumry, Commander of the St. Kitts Nevis Defense Force, Mr. Sheila Connor, Superintendent of Prisons, Ms. Dion Francis, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Justice, Ms. Everett O'Garo, Fire and Rescue Services, Distinguished guests, good morning. It is my distinct pleasure on behalf of the resident judges in the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis to welcome all of you to this special sitting of the court to mark the commencement of the new law year 2018-2019. Last year, nature denied us the opportunity to play host to this auspicious event, as we recall all too well the havoc that was wreaked by the passage of hurricanes Irma and Maria through several of our member states. The ceremonial opening had to be canceled as priority naturally shifted to the task of recovery and reconstruction, and indeed, their survival. The last couple of weeks perhaps produced some anxious moments as it seemed that a similar threat loomed once more. But God in his infinite goodness and grace spared us all and blessed us with radiant sunshine which has made it possible for us to gather here today. Our theme this year is challenges, opportunities, and resilience. The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court paving the way to a modern and efficient judiciary for the Eastern Caribbean. The first challenge I submit has been successfully hurdled. Appropriately, therefore, we commenced the day's proceedings with an inspirational and uplifting ecumenical church service at the Zion Moravian Church, culminating with Father Cassius's insightful and interpretive perspective on our chosen theme. Fortified by the blessings received, we set out on a wonderful procession in the sweltering heat, appropriately clad in our black robes. As I made my way along the procession, sweating profusely, 
the words of Dr. Henry Brown, Queen's Council, came to mind, and he would say, this is a hard way to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> but we sold it on. We look forward to the year ahead, mindful of the inevitable challenges that will confront us along the way, poised to seize the opportunities that arise, and resolved to effect the transformation of the judiciary in realization of our shared vision for a futuristic court. This we can accomplish by all stakeholders working harmoniously together. I look forward to that continued collaboration. At this stage of the proceedings, it is my pleasure to yield to the Honorable Chief Justice, her ladyship named Janice Pereira, who will deliver the opening address to be carried live to the other member states and territories throughout the region. May it please. Thank you. Justice Ward, Justices of Appeal, Judges and Masters of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Their Excellencies, Heads of State of each of the OECS member states and territories, the Honorable Timothy Harris, Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, and Honorable Heads of Government of each of the OECS member states and territories. Retired judges of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, the Honorable Vincent Byron, Attorney General of St. Kitts and Nevis, and the Honorable Attorneys General of each of the OECS member states and territories. Honorable Ministers of Government of St. Kitts and Nevis, and of each of the OECS member states and territories, Chief or Senior Magistrates and Magistrates of each of the OECS Member States and Territories, Honorable Speakers of the Houses of Assembly and Presidents of the Senate of each of the OECS Member States and Territories, Honorable Leaders of the Opposition of each of the OECS Member States and Territories, Members of Parliament, of each of the OECS member states and territories. Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS Commission. Mr. Valston Graham, Director of Public Prosecutions of St. Kitts and Nevis and Directors of Public Prosecutions of each of the OECS member states and territories. Solicitors General of each of the OECS member states and territories. Mrs. Michelle John Thibbles, Chief Registrar, Ms. Desma Charles, Deputy Chief Registrar, Registrars and Deputy and Assistant Registrars of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Mr. Gregory Girard, Court Administrator of the Court's Headquarters, Mr. Francis Letang, Deputy Court Administrator of the Court's Headquarters, Mr. Thaddeus Antoine, President of the OECS Bar Association, President of the Bar Association of St. Kitts and Nevis and Presidents of the Constituent Bar Associations of each of the OECS member states and territories. Learned members of the Inner Bar of each of the OECS member states and territories. Learned members of the Utter Bar in St. Kitts and Nevis and of each of the OECS member states and territories. Members of the clergy, members of the diplomatic corps, Mr. Ian Queeley, Commissioner of Police of St. Kitts and Nevis, and Commissioners of Police of each of the OECS member states and territories. Police officers in St. Kitts and Nevis and each of the OECS member states and territories. Mr. Ashiel Connor, Acting Superintendent of Prisons in St. Kitts and Nevis, and other directors, heads of correctional facilities in each of the OECS member states and territories staff of the court's headquarters and the various court offices in each of the OECS member states and territories, distinguished guests, students, citizens and residents of the Eastern Caribbean, good morning. It is my honor and indeed my pleasure to address you on this occasion of the opening of the 2018 2019 law year. Today's address 
is being broadcast live by a simulcast from the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis to all the other eight member states and territories of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, where special sittings are also taking place. Persons across the region and indeed the world are also listening in to this address on the radio and via the internet. The Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis celebrates tomorrow its 35th year of independence. I extend to the government and people of the Federation heartiest congratulations on the occasion of this anniversary. This year's address holds particular significance as it has now been two years since I have had the opportunity to address you on the commencement of a new law year. As many of you would know, last year's activities to mark the opening of the 2017-2018 law year were to take place on the nature isle of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Hurricane Maria intervened, bringing all activities to an abrupt halt. All sittings of the court had to be vacated. This storm caused much death and destruction in Dominica and occurred a mere two weeks after Hurricane Irma caused death and widespread destruction along the northern Caribbean island chain, including the territories of Anguilla, the Virgin Islands, and the island of Barbuda. These Category 5 hurricanes set new records in terms of their intensity and will not soon be forgotten by the people of the Caribbean. One year on, some level of normalcy has returned to these islands, but the effects linger on. As we sit here today, we are no doubt all aware that we are in the height of the hurricane season. We had a narrow miss with Isaac last week. It is my fervent hope and prayer that our Caribbean region will be spared the ravages of any more storms this year. I want to dwell a bit on the impacts of the hurricane season last year. Because these hurricanes severely impacted normal governmental operations across the affected islands, and without exception, the operations of the judiciary. I will therefore use the first part of this address to briefly share with you the impact on the court's operations and to provide an update on where matters stand today. The island of Anguilla. The eye wall of Hurricane Maria, Irma, sorry, passed over the territory of Anguilla on 6 September 2018, causing widespread destruction. The court building, as well as the residence of the high court judge, received some damage. The court facility was forced to remain closed for several weeks whilst repairs were made and utility services restored. This physical interruption, though, did not prevent the hearing of urgent applications by telephone and video link as soon as telecommunications were restored by the direct routing of hearings to a judge located in St. Lucia. Full appeal hearings were also conducted in person and via video link from St. Lucia. Today, the court's facilities are once more fully functional and were first to resume full operations after the storm. <clears throat> the Virgin Islands. The territory of the Virgin Islands received the brunt of Hurricane Irma as the eye passed directly over Tortola on the 6th of September, 2017. It caused a catastrophic damage to the territory, which is still in the process of recovering. Court infrastructure was severely damaged. Judges and some court staff were rendered homeless. And all operations of the courts came to a halt. A breakdown of law and order threatened. The state of St. Lucia provided early refuge. One of the immediate measures put in place is the temporary was the temporary relocation of the commercial division of the High Court, a critical component of that territory's financial sector, to the state of St. Lucia, where the court's headquarters is based. 
The temporary relocation of the two commercial division judges, along with some members of the court staff from the Virgin Islands, the utilization of a rudimentary system of electronic filing via email, the use of other ICT technology put in place by the IT team of the headquarters, complemented by emergency procedural measures and support from staff of the court's headquarters allowed that division to continue its operations seamlessly. All matters listed for hearing came on as scheduled. Indeed, it was said by many legal practitioners who experienced this temporary e-filing arrangement that the court's processes, by use of this rudimentary method, was operating even more efficiently than the normal paper filings. If there was a need for an argument supporting a paperless judiciary, and as the way forward for building resiliency to natural disasters, the experience of the BVI's commercial division made it convincingly. I should also add that during this period, Full appeal hearings for the Virgin Islands were held without disruption by means of video link and in-person appearances from courtrooms in St. Lucia. At this juncture, it is only fitting that I pause for a moment to express thanks to the Prime Minister and Government of St. Lucia for quickly coming to the aid of the Virgin Islands in facilitating the temporary relocation of the commercial division to St. Lucia during that difficult time. This speaks to the heights which can be achieved and the possibilities which can become realities when there is a will to do so. The commercial division resumed operations in the Virgin Islands in January 2018. The operations of the main civil and criminal divisions, however, took longer to get up and running. This was due to several factors beyond the court's control, such as a greater reliance on physical files, many of which were damaged or lost during the hurricane and requiring reconstruction, as well as the need for the appearance of litigants and witnesses in person, not to mention the risks inherent in the movement of prisoners or accused persons on remand. Notwithstanding these limitations, the court was able to accommodate the hearings of urgent applications, including applications for bail, via video and teleconference, conducted by a judge at court facilities in St. Lucia. All divisions of the High Court became fully operational in the Virgin Islands by the middle of February this year. The Commonwealth of Dominica. Hurricane Maria, which struck Dominica on 18 September 2017, resulted in the almost complete destruction of that island. One year on, the island is still struggling to return to some sense of normalcy. The court's infrastructure was severely damaged with judges and staff, court staff, rendered homeless. Here, too, a breakdown of law and order threatened. Sadly, one year on, court facilities have not been restored to normal operations. Here, there was an even heavier reliance on paper records, and many of them have been reported lost or destroyed. These factors, coupled with a lack of operational facilities, make recovery slower. Some hearings have been facilitated in makeshift facilities while repair works are ongoing. The hearing of appeals from Dominica was also facilitated by the Court of Appeal sitting in St. Lucia. It is our hope that all efforts will be made to enable the courts to return to full operations. The court's headquarters has been doing all within its power to make this happen and has reached out to donor agencies for assistance in replacing the destroyed court equipment 
necessary for returning the courts to a state of operational efficiency. International donors, such as Global Affairs Canada, through the Juris Project, executed through the Caribbean Court of Justice, as well as the US Embassy, have responded positively to our request and the procurement processes to source and purchase replacement equipment are well underway. Assistance is also being sought from the European Union. Quite apart from that, financial and other support was quickly forthcoming from our neighboring institutions, judges, and organizations. I make specific mention of relief funds generously given by judges of the Caribbean Court of Justice the Caribbean Association of Judicial Officers, the OECS Bar Association and its constituent bar associations across the member states and territories, the judges and staff of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's headquarters. I take this opportunity to publicly thank our regional judicial counterparts, international donor agencies, our court staff, judges, and our regional organizations and associations for their contributions and other assistance to the recovery efforts in our affected member states and territories. Even though the court has suffered setbacks because of these horrific storms, these provided an opportunity for our communities to truly experience firsthand the positively unique character of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and what it truly means to be a regional court. The ease with which the court was able to continue managing, although not optimally, the judicial processes of the affected islands lies within the legislative framework which established the court. It is this framework which allows any judge of the court, irrespective of state or residency assignment, to hear matters from any affected member state in another member state. Arrangements to be made are merely administrative. There was no requirement for legislative or other intervention. The ability of the court to operate in this way must be seen and guarded <clears throat> as a most useful and remarkable utility, being one which allows the court to continue to serve affected states and territories and thereby provide access to justice even in times of disasters. This framework in and of itself should be recognized as a strong foundation on which to build an even more resilient framework for ensuring access to justice by the implementation of systems which can effectively manage and support the court's operations under any adverse condition. Although disasters may cause the court to bow, disasters should never be allowed to cause the court and access to justice to become broken. Out of the depths of adversity, there are always positive and enduring lessons to be learned. It also brings forth that positive human desire to innovate, create, and seize opportunities. It only remains for us, in turn, to turn these desires into positive action in moving forward. In the words of the former First Lady of the United States of America, Michelle Obama, and I quote, you should never view your challenges as a disadvantage. Instead, it is important for you to understand that your experience facing and overcoming adversity is actually one of your biggest advantages. I am inspired by the sermon I delivered this morning by Father Cassius, around the theme of this year's address. He reminded us, tough times don't last, tough people do. This leads into the second part of my address 
And that is to update you on the work of the court over the last perhaps two years. Despite the setbacks, the court has been busy pursuing its mission to continue its reform processes aimed at improving the quality of justice. Firstly, I wish to highlight the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's Sentencing Guidelines Project, which is well underway. It has long been recognized that for this court to serve the people of the Eastern Caribbean region in an efficient and transparent manner, it must continuously find ways to improve its processes and procedures and embrace systems and methods that are transparent and easily understood by the people it serves. Over time, it became increasingly apparent that the sentencing process in a criminal trial across OECS states was being approached in different ways with results which to the public appeared to be disparate. Sentencing is one of the areas of great public interest and one which attracts much comment, some of which are often uninformed. In the criminal justice system, the sentencing process is one of utmost importance as it invariably engages the liberty of the subject. It therefore calls for deliberate and mature consideration in order to ensure that public confidence in the justice system is maintained. The passing of a sentence must not just be done right, but must also be understood as having been done right. It was out of this desire to assist judicial officers and more importantly, the desire to bring consistency to the approach to sentencing, and in so doing transparency and a greater sense of fairness to the sentencing process, that the idea of a sentencing guidelines project took root. This project began more than a year ago in November 2016, with financial assistance being provided by the joint collaboration between the United Kingdom Foreign Office and the United States of America, with oversight provided by Ms. Sarah Abraham, criminal justice advisor to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. By July last year, we had formed a committee of experienced jurists and other experts from within our court, the Caribbean, and the United Kingdom. This committee is called the Sentencing Advisory Committee. It held its inaugural meeting in July last year and has been hard at work since then crafting draft sentencing guidelines for use by judges and magistrates in our region. The work has focused on rolling out sentencing guidelines in respect of drugs, firearms, theft, robbery, and sexual offenses as the first series of guidelines. Thereafter, we intend to roll out additional guidelines in respect of other offenses, all to be applied in accordance with sentencing principles, which will be set out in a sentencing practice direction to be issued by the court. The first set of these draft guidelines was introduced to all judicial officers at the annual judicial conference for judges over a three-day period during the last week of July this year, and to magistrates over a two-day conference following immediately thereafter. The response from all judicial officers has been positive. The Sentencing Guidelines Project and a sampling of the draft guidelines produced to date were also introduced to members of the bar, as well as prosecutors across the OECS region over this past weekend. In fact, yesterday, Sunday, at the joint symposium of the OECS Bar Association and the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, their response has also been encouraging. Thereafter, it is intended that a further consultative process engaging the wider public will be undertaken in each state and territory over the next few months. I place on record my sincere appreciation for all the hard work 
undertaken so far by all members of the Sentencing Advisory Committee. But I feel I would be remiss were I not to say special thanks to Justice Morley, who serves Antigua and Barbuda and Mount Strat as co-chair of this committee and who drives this process, Justice Trevor Ward, our own resident judge of St. Kitts, who serves this circuit, Justice of Appeal, Alice York Suhorn, appellate judge of the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago, Justice Dame Maura McGowan of the Royal Courts of Justice of the Criminal Division of England and Wales, Justice Shiraz Aziz, a former High Court judge of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, now a judge of the Turks and Caicos Islands, for ably conducting all the training sessions on the draft guidelines at our judicial conferences. Last, but no means least, I express my sincere appreciation and thanks to Justice of Appeal Thom, who unfortunately is unable to be here with us today due to circumstances beyond her control, and who is chair of our Judicial Education Institute, because she took this project fully on board and continues to do all within her power to assist me in making the guidelines become a reality. I have no doubt that Justice Thom will be listening once she's able to do so to this address today. Now, the objective of this project is to assist judicial officers in providing structured and well-reasoned sentence remarks as a normal practice and in a format which would encourage their publication. These remarks will build up a bank of authority to assist courts, legal practitioners, students of law, and the public to better understand the sentencing process and in turn promote greater confidence in the criminal justice system. Viewed through the eyes of the public, it is not so much the ultimate sentence arrived at, but rather understanding the reasoning leading to that sentence. The aim of this project is not to achieve uniformity of sentences, but rather consistency in the approach to sentencing, so as to promote fairness and transparency in the process. The second project I wish to highlight is the implementation of a sexual offenses model court it has been observed over the years that the number of sexual offenses brought before the court has been on the increase. This, of course, does not mean that the commission of sexual offenses has increased. It may be that more sexual offenses are being reported and being prosecuted as gender sensitivity awareness grows across all levels of our societies. It is important, therefore, that the court be equipped to deal with these matters in a way that also addresses the sensitivity of these types of cases, particularly as it relates to the vulnerability of complainants involved, especially children and young persons. After conducting a review, it was considered that the state of Antigua and Barbuda at this time was best suited for the establishment of a sexual offenses model court. The aim of the initiative is to improve the ability of the court to provide more gender responsive services and to be more focused and understanding of the sensitivity cases and sensitivity of cases involving victims of sexual offenses. To this end, much work has been underway for the implementation of such a court and it is the hope that it will be operationalized before the end of this year. This project is being spearheaded by the Judicial Reform and Institutional Strengthening, the Juris Project, as I said before, executed through the Caribbean Court of Justice as the executed, executing regional agency. It is hoped that the successes from this pilot in Antigua and Barbuda will lead to the implementation of similar courts 
in other member states and territories. I take this opportunity to record my appreciation to all the personnel engaged by jurists in making this model court a reality. Judicial training. Thirdly, the court through the Judicial Education Institute continues with its work in providing judicial education for newly appointed judges as well as for all judicial officers, magistrates, and staff of the court. In addition to the training in relation to the draft sentencing guidelines at the annual judicial conference this year, we also were the beneficiaries of training sponsored by the World Intellectual Property Organization. We are grateful to them for the opportunity this provided to our judicial officers to gain a fuller appreciation of the law relating to intellectual property, and more importantly, for strengthening our capacity to deal with intellectual property disputes, an ever-growing area given the super connectivity of the world and all the opportunities which this presents for proper and improper exploitation. We thank them for partnering with us. I also once more thank the chairman of the Judicial Education Institute, the staff of that institute, and all the other members of staff at the court's headquarters for their tireless efforts in planning and coordinating our education programs. Doing so is by no means a simple task, given or spread across the OECS island states. So far, I have spoken of activities which we were only able to undertake, mainly with the kind assistance of the international donors I have mentioned. Judicial reform and judicial education go hand in hand in effecting real change. One cannot succeed without the other. Two sides of the same coin. We are grateful, therefore, for the continued support of those donors. We share a mutual interest, that of improving the quality of justice, which would lead to a more just society. When the people in any country can place the highest confidence in their justice system, it ensures greater peace and security. The ability of any country to enjoy peace and security impacts positively on its economy and its place in the world. In these times, the news is replete, the world news is replete, with the distressing news of failed states, which have been causing the dislocation <laughs> and migration of entire communities of people, the horrific crimes committed against them, and all the other attendant adverse consequences. Within our region, we must remain vigilant and do all we can to ensure the rights and freedoms which we often take for granted are never diminished, and their vindication by access to justice is not whittled down or rendered illusory. This brings me to the steps which the court has undertaken over the past two years to reform various procedures within the court's civil jurisdiction. Firstly, with the cooperation of the bulk of member states and territories, the court was able to implement a more modern and user-friendly set of procedures for dealing with the estates of deceased persons. In 2017, the court implemented the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court Non-Contentious Probate and Administration of Estates Rules, 2017. The intention of these rules was to harmonize the procedure for non-contentious probate and administration of estates proceedings across the OECS. Formally, Different procedures guided the probate and administrative processes in the different member states and territories. Accordingly, for several years, the need for the development of a uniform suite of non-contentious probate rules had been the subject of much discussion in the OECS region. 
Following a consultancy, a draft set of rules was prepared as early as 2003. However, it was not until 2013 that steps to engage in further consultations with a view to finalizing them were undertaken, save for two states where the process is ongoing for the implementation. All other states have brought the rules into operation. As with any procedural reform, their application is being monitored for any necessary adjustments. To complement the new probate and administration of estates rules, the court fees associated therewith were also revised and harmonized given the vast disparities across states, not to mention the very dated rates, some set as far back as the 1950s and wholly discordant with the services rendered. Simultaneously, with the implementation of the probate rules, the court, after a consultative process, also implemented a harmonized suite of court filing fees. This was again necessary, as the court fees across the OECS states saw many disparities and variations for invoking the same court process, pursuant to the same rules of procedure governing those court processes. It was recognized that this disjointed approach does not serve the court as well as it should, as the court seeks to move to the next stage of reforming its processes through digitization and the use of ICT. Furthermore, there is still the perception <clears throat> held by many, by, by some, I should say, that courts simply drain the court's coffers of revenue. This is an ill-perceived view, but understandable when one considers the requirements for filing fees to be paid by postage stamps. These revenues are not attributed to the operations of the courts, but rather the operations of post offices. That said, it must always be recognized that the court is not intended to be a revenue center its mandate is completely different. Courts exist for the administration and delivery of justice to all, the state and subjects of the state alike. It was time that this court, like many other courts around the world, and in keeping with the independent exercise of its jurisdiction and powers, be allowed to manage in the same way that it prescribes rules of procedure, to prescribe by rules of court as envisaged under the Supreme Court order, the rates applicable to its procedures. This approach lends expression to the principle of the separation of powers on which all our democracies are based and grounded as they are in respect for and adherence for the rule of law. By way of example, just as the, judi the judiciary cannot tell the legislative branch of government whether it should pass a law decriminalizing marijuana or the executive branch whether to build a large or a small airport, so too the operation and management of the court's processes and the methodology it considers best suited for its operation as solely the purview of the judiciary. It is appreciated that the three branches of government must coexist and must interface, but each must do so, exercising at all times due respect and deference to the boundaries of the other. One branch must not seek to exert influence over the other, lest the independent function of each be compromised and the principle of the separation of powers rendered worthless. 
The revised fees have been implemented in all but two states. This harmonized fee structure, which is to provide for filing fees to be paid by modern payment methods, such as debit cards, credit cards, escrow account debits, and the like, helpfully places the court in the best possible position to realize one of the court's key objectives that of bringing the court into the 21st century by the utilization of e-filing and enhanced electronic case management, allowing for speedy classification and case scheduling, so as to bring to the court systems an unheralded level of efficiency, as well as transparency. The harmonized fee structure has provided the court, a regional court with a single jurisdiction running throughout the nine member states and territories, the proper platform from which to launch the court's e-litigation portal. It is to this subject which I now turn. A few years ago, the court started on a search for electronic platforms to replace the GEMS software, which is an off-the-shelf, non-web-based software, which had clearly outgrown much of its usefulness over time, with little hope of providing needed upgrades to enable operations in a digitized and an electronically connected modern world. The court, like any other organization, had to decide whether to get on board or risk being left behind. We were in search of a solution that could be uniquely tailored to the needs of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, as well as the magistracy, with a range of user-friendly features which would revolutionize the ease of doing court business right across the court's nine member states and territories jurisdiction as a singular, cohesive, and integrated platform, operational and accessible from wherever practitioners may be. No doubt, the concept of the ease of doing business has a familiar ring. The economic outlook of countries is now routinely measured by the ease of doing business. It can be no surprise that the performance of the judiciary in its ability to timely decide disputes is a key factor determining where a country ranks on this internationally recognized business index. And so, with these considerations in mind, and being mindful of the objective we are seeking to achieve, we searched for a tested partner who could deliver a robust software platform, complete with technical support when needed. And so after conducting that review and observing the platform at work in Singapore, we were fully satisfied that the company, Crimson Logic, with their proven track record in many other parts of the world, including Singapore, in building e-litigation platforms for use in several common law-based judiciaries, had the quality product which is best suited for this court's operations. For over a year, the court has been collaborating with that company in designing and customizing the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's e-litigation portal. This involved fieldwork, examinations of our current operations, and discussions with stakeholders, both internal and external, so as to fine tune the electronic mapping of the court's management processes in accordance with the court's instructions. Much work has been undertaken by the IT department of the court and other court personnel. I am happy to announce that we are now ready to launch the system, beginning with the state of St. Lucia and the court's headquarters 
to be followed in short order by the territories of the Virgin Islands and Anguilla. The rollout will continue from state to state until all member states and territories are linked. I am excited about this development. It is my hope that all court users and staff will also be excited about this development. Following a tagline competition among court staff across our nine member states and territories, I am pleased to announce that the tagline for the e-litigation portal is this, the ECSC e-litigation portal, serving you on time and online. The winning entry was submitted by Mr. Mervyn Toussaint of the Grenada High Court Office. We congratulate Mr. Toussaint for coming up with what I consider to be a most fitting tagline given that the implementation of the e-litigation portal will bring about tremendous time and cost savings for current users and legal practitioners in a convenient and accessible manner. It will no longer be necessary to spend valuable time traveling to the court office to file a claim or a document in a case or to seek to beat the court office office's closing time, as was referenced as recent as last week. With the EECSC litigation portal, you will now be able to file anytime from any place. There will no longer be the need to physically attend the court office to conduct a search and worse yet, spend valuable time awaiting the physical pulling of a file from some distant vault cabinet or other location, or lose patience over a misplaced and sometimes completely missing file. There are also the benefits to be derived from no longer having to prepare numerous paper bundles, which are both time consuming and costly, and then having to truck them off to the court office for another waiting period of manual stamping of each copy. It eliminates the need for all the large storage spaces required within the court offices for proper safekeeping and the issues associated with quick retrieval. I have not seen a court office in recent times which does not suffer from inadequate space, while the mountains of paper continue to grow up around court staff who are given the tasks of trying to do their best to keep track of documents in a physically challenging and oftentimes chaotic environment. With the e-litigation portal, trial bundles and appeal bundles can be created and uploaded online with a click. This should be music to some legal practitioners' heirs, who have sometimes found it difficult to prepare, collate, and index the numbers of required trial and appeal bundles. The appellate court, which is itinerant, knows all too well the costs, time lost, and the stress involved in traveling back and forth across the subregion with boxes and boxes of material, a tremendous cost to the court, unfaithful liat. <laughs> it is a faithful airline, and we enjoy, thankfully, a very good relationship. We also have, as well, the on-land on transportation and the additional manpower and resources at each point for moving all this weighty material sometimes more than three times over. And our Court of Appeal, we have experienced oftentimes in some states some stressful times in relation to the movement of all of those boxes of material. And so the cost savings and efficiency to be gained from such a system are tremendous and, in my view, 
obvious. I see this step as the dawn of a new day in our continuous stride to improve access to justice and justice and delivery of justice. I was privileged to hear a couple months ago the Minister of Jamaica, the Minister of Justice in Jamaica, speak of the new face of justice being implemented there by use of similar measures as I am addressing here. As I listened, I felt excited and happy for Jamaica, but I am even more excited for us in the OECS. As with the devising of rules of procedure for the operation and management of the court's processes, so too the choice of the methodology or platform to utilize, whether by way of paper, be it white, pink, or blue, or by way of digitization, are all operational matters falling solely within the purview of the judiciary and no other branch of government, entity, or person. Of this much, I am certain. Nonetheless, it has been quite a journey over the past year, with some distractions seeking to creep in along the way in getting to this stage. The court, however, has remained focused and committed to its mission, to doing all within its power to provide better and greater access to justice and delivery of justice by using all avenues available to it for so doing. In addition to these initiatives, I also make mention of the court's ongoing efforts under the, court, the court's courtroom technology enhancement project. Under this project, the court has step by step been engaged in the procurement and installation of IT equipment to assist in transforming the courtrooms across the member states and territories to become more efficient by operating as a seamless communication center. The goal of this project as a first step is to equip at least one courtroom across each of the member states and territories with modern video and audio capability, as well as the digitization of court proceedings by using audio transcripts and ultimately transcripts in real time. It is our goal that in time, all courtrooms will be fully equipped. What are the benefits of these? Again, real savings in time, money, and improved efficiency. If a litigant or a witness can access the court without the need for travel by land, air, or by sea, but instead can fully participate in a proceeding by a video or audio link, then that results in tremendous cost savings to the litigant, including the state, in relation to airfares, land transportation, not to mention hotel accommodation and other attendant expenses. Of utmost importance is the enhanced security and safety, which this brings to critical witnesses, particularly in criminal trials. We are all too familiar with the fate that has befallen fallen many such witnesses. It also enhances efficiency in the disposal rates of matters, which might otherwise have to be adjourned because of the inability of a witness or litigant to travel. And short, enhanced access to justice. I pause here to say this, because I think I need to give this example. What improved audio and video technology does. This was amply demonstrated last week on the 11th of September when the Court of Appeal sat during its recess to hear an urgent appeal 
involving the grant of an injunction halting the construction of an international airport on the island of Barbuda. The panel of the court was constituted with two justices of appeal located in St. Lucia, one justice of appeal located in the Virgin Islands with lawyers on one for one party located in Antigua and lawyers for another party located in the United Kingdom. All this was facilitated by the use of video link aided by high-speed internet. The hearing was seamless. All parties could see and hear each other. <clears throat> and hear each other. Notably, the judges were also able to confer amongst themselves in real time as if they were in one physical space. A decision by the court was rendered on the same day. This is the standard we are trying to achieve for normal operations. This is achievable if there is the will on the part of the executive branch of governments to adequately resource the court. This brings me to the frustrations currently experienced by litigants and practitioners, as well as judges, with the current incapacity of the court offices across many member states to produce transcripts of court proceedings. This deficiency cannot be overstated right here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. There is a list of pending appeals, the bulk from the High Court, which are not progressing for the lack of transcripts. But the Federation is not alone. In some other states, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica, Grenada, the story is much the same, and in some cases worse. Transcripts of court proceedings are vital to the appellate process in the bulk of cases. This current incapacity has been rendered so by the failure of many governments to provide the courts with the needed personnel and equipment for the production of transcripts. Pleas have been made by me directly to governments. I have had discussions with government officials on these shortcomings particularly in those states where the resultant delays in the ability of litigants to prosecute their appeals have become especially troubling. These failures are threatening and in some cases have resulted in a denial of access to justice. The ability to use transcripts or the production of real time transcripts by the installation and use of modern equipment for this purpose provides a solution to this vexing and troubling problem. To my mind, the lasting benefits of all these measures are self-evident. They are all aimed at achieving one objective, proper access to justice and delivery of justice. If justice is not properly accessible at the bottom levels of the justice system, then there can be no accessibility at any level of the justice system. Access to justice is not calibrated to flow from the top down, but from the bottom up. I take this opportunity to again urge the governments of the member states and territories to support the court in these initiatives in order to improve for its people their ability to access justice and to ensure a better quality of the delivery of justice. I come to court facilities. The lack of proper court facilities is as old as the court itself. Over the years, I and Chief Justices before me 
have repeatedly spoken of and pleaded for the urgent need for governments to give some priority to and provide adequate court facilities. 51 years on, since the establishment of this court, little, if anything, has been done. Courtrooms are still housed in ill-suited buildings, which have posed attendant security and health risks to court users and occupiers. Whilst courtroom closures are understandable following the passage of hurricanes and the like, it is unacceptable that court users and occupiers have been consistently placed in harm's way in respect of their health and security. This year, we have experienced the closure of the criminal court facilities in St. Lucia for security reasons and the closure of all courthouses in Grenada for health reasons. These failures pose a real threat to access to justice and the delivery of justice. I have urged the heads of those member states affected by the hurricanes to include the Halls of Justice Project in their reconstruction programs. I take this opportunity to again all, uh, urge all heads of government in member states to prioritize the construction of halls of justice and make them a reality. You, the people of this region, must be interested and must voice that interest in having these matters addressed. The courts are there to serve you and you must become engaged in the changes you wish to see. The budgetary allocation for the operations of the court in any of the member states and territories is less than 3% of the annual budget of any of the states in any year. Yet, the financial position of the court year after year remains of grave concern. I am unable to stay silent about it. This court does not have the benefit of a trust fund arrangement, which at least serves as a buffer between the judiciary and the executive, which holds the power of the purse. This court must seek approval each year for its operational budget. Even so, the court is constantly faced with the failure of some states, and I say some states, not all, to honor their financial obligations. Arrears continue to mount in respect of monies due to the court. Currently, the aggregate of arrears in contributions due to the court stands at just over $22 million. These shortcomings pose real risks to the administration of justice as they affect the court's ability to plan and implement programs or to employ resources vital to, for bringing about reforms or to keep the court functioning as it should. These failures undermine access to justice and the delivery of justice. <clears throat> the current financial arrangement and the lack of insulation feeds the perception held by many that he who pays the piper calls the tune. Or put another way, that there is a real risk of the exertion of influence over the judiciary. It does nothing to dispel this perception or lend true meaning and purpose to the principle of the separation of powers and to protect against what can be an irresistible <coughs> temptation. It is time that proper financial arrangements 
are put in place for the full and effective operations of this court or foundational and constitutional courts. I therefore call upon all heads of government to address the situation and remove once and for all these perceived notions held by many across our region. This morning, the Reverend spoke about the fears that we have. Let us remove those fears once and for all and banish them. These fears are not dispelled by lip service, but by taking the appropriate action. It would do much to improve the confidence of the public in the justice system across the length and breadth of our region. That said, I think it is important to share with you some information in respect of the day-to-day -day operations of the court. Notwithstanding the chaos wrought by the killer storms and the persistent financial constraints experienced, the court has maintained a busy schedule. In 2017, 450 appeals were filed at the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal heard a staggering, I want you to listen to this number well, a staggering 1,302 matters consisting of full court hearings, chamber hearings, video and teleconferences, status hearings, in the same year, the Court of Appeal delivered 881 decisions, 67 of which were written judgments and 814 oral decisions. Place this in the context of the number of days in a calendar year. Don't leave out the court recesses each day. That's 365. That equates to an average daily hearing rate of about four matters and an average daily delivery rate of more than two. This is with a complement of six judges, including myself, at the appellate level. I ask that you point me to any other court in this region, or anywhere else for that matter, which carries this workload. At the level of the High Court, 7,197 cases were filed across all the member states and territories in 2017. In the same year, 4,851 cases were disposed. The overall clearance rate of cases for the year was 67.40%. That marked a decline from 2016, which was 83.65%. No doubt this decline was in part due to the impact of the hurricanes on the affected member states and territories. But for a more detailed and clearer picture of the trends in cases heard and disposed by this court. When I say this court, I mean across our OECS states. I urge you to read the court's annual report. It is available online at the court's website. You will find it interesting, the sheer volume of the work this court must handle across its member states and territories every year. You may ask, how is this achievable? given the constraints that I have highlighted, the answer lies right before you. The committed men and women of the judiciary who work tirelessly and with integrity to deliver justice to the people of our region. So we strive for resiliency. Let me be clear, I am not suggesting that there are not shortcomings or that there are not instances where criticism 
is justified. As Father Cassius reminded us this morning, no system of justice is perfect. We continue to strive for the ideal. However, the empirical data, which can be searched and examined by anyone interested, demonstrates that the court is in fact a success. Unfortunately, it is easier to criticize the few shortfalls and paint everyone with the same broad brush than it is to address the underlying causes and to provide solutions. I am always heartened when our court is complemented by persons from outside of our region. And when I say our region outside of the OECS, or farther afield within our region. And they compliment us on the work and the performance of this court and how much they look to our court and the cases published on our website for guidance. If our website goes down for a day, calls or email queries flow in from regions as far away as India this is testament to the global reach of our court in today's world. On that note, it is important for me to recognize the tremendous efforts of the persons who have ensured that this court has truly served the people of our states for the last 51 years and their commitment to soldier on into the future. Firstly, the judicial officers of this court, including our magistrates, who work tirelessly every day, often under less than optimal conditions and with inadequate resources, but who continue to ensure the delivery of decisions that are fair and just. Secondly, and behind the scenes, the support staff of the court working at various levels at the court's headquarters, as well as constituent court offices in each of the member states and territories. These are some of the most dedicated individuals you could meet and who often go unnoticed for their unwavering dedication to the court and indeed their countries. The judiciary, whilst always striving to maintain its independence, invariably works together with other branches of government. The heads of government of the nine member states and territories, we hope, will commit to providing an environment and adequate space for the court to undertake its work independently and impartially without fear or favor. To this end, we acknowledge the work of the various ministries of legal affairs and ministries of justice for the important role they play in providing the support to ensure the running of our court offices and the provision of spaces that are made to function as courtrooms and other facilities. We also salute the hardworking men and women who serve on the various police forces and correctional facilities across our member states and territories. These men and women work under extremely trying circumstances to keep you, the people of the Eastern Caribbean, safe and secure as best they can. We also thank the, uh, the attorneys general, directors of public prosecutions, prosecutors, Crown Council, and members of the bar across the OECS for the hard work they do and the role they play in maintaining and promoting the rule of law, and the proper administration of justice in our region. To the citizens and residents of the OECS, we work hard every day to ensure you have a justice system you can depend on and feel proud of. We know you place your confidence in us each day to do what is fair and just and to maintain a justice system of the utmost integrity we will continue to work diligently to ensure that your confidence in your court never wanes. 
For over 50 years, this court has been a model regional court. Our hope is that as we transition into a more modern court, we will be able to better serve you. No doubt, the court will continue to exist in an ever-changing environment. New ICT solutions will be developed. New case law will emerge. New rules and processes will be drafted to guide the judiciary. The court will have to ensure it continuously reviews and makes the necessary changes to remain an institution at the forefront of all the changes, all the changes that the future holds, or at least seek to keep pace with it. We ask you, the people of the Eastern Caribbean, for your continued support as we continue our mission to serve you and to serve you better as we undertake the measures of which I have spoken to improve your access to justice and delivery of justice. I end with an excerpt from the prayer by Reverend Christian this morning. We ask God to sustain us in our duties, to grant us humility and sound judgment, to forgive our errors and to inspire us in our service. I thank you. Vincent Byron, Attorney General. Thank you very much, Your Lordship. Um, your Ladyship, mm -hmm. Dame Janice Pereira, Chief Justice, Justices of the Court of Appeal, Resident Judges of the Senkis and Nevis Circuits, Chief Registrar and Registrar of the High Court, Director of Public Prosecutions, and Solicitor General, Senior Magistrate and other members of the Magistracy, President of the OECS Bar, President of the Sengis and Nevis Bar, Learned members of the Inner and Utter Bar. I also would want to recognize Commissioner of Police and the Prison Keeper. And I would recognize the hardworking staff of the court, ladies and gentlemen gathered here. It gives me great pleasure as Attorney General and as Minister of Justice and Legal Affairs, to welcome you this morning to this uh, Lee Llewellyn Moore Judicial and Legal Complex, to this the opening of the new law year 2018-2019. Your, your Ladyship, I must, I note that we are without His Excellency, um, uh, S.W. Tabley Seaton, who shared with us um, this morning at the church service opening the new law year. Um, I would also want to, and I know that he's not here with us, but that his deputy, the Governor General's deputy, Mr. Michael Morton, is here in his stead, and I would want to recognize him. I'd want to apologize for the absence of the Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris, the Prime Minister, who was unavoidably delayed and could not be with us this morning. Um, I would want to note, Your Ladyship, that even though His Excellency is not here with us, I'm sure his thoughts would be with us as 
I note that he was our first Attorney General of an independent St. Kitts and Nevis and served some 15 years in that capacity. Your leadership, the court would be aware that during this period, tomorrow, Sept September 19th, to be exact, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis is celebrating its 35th anniversary as an independent nation. This year, the theme of our country's celebration is love, service, patriotism, and pride, Independence 35. It is a time to be patriotic, a time to renew our commitment to the values espoused in nationhood. And I, on behalf of the executive, the government of St. Gisela Nevis, the government in which I serve, I would want to reaffirm our belief in and our commitment to the rule of law and the administration of justice here in St. Gisela Nevis. I recall your leadership that the passage of Hurricane Irma, Hurricanes Irma and Maria last year at this time precluded the ceremony to herald in the start of the new law year. And it would be remiss of me not to note the successful celebrations under the theme, embracing the past, celebrating the future, that ended earlier this year, um, the commemorations of the 50th anniversary of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court that came into being on the 27th of February, 1967 some 51 years ago. The court remains an integral part of our nation states, and every day it strives to live up to its mission statement, to serve its member states by providing access to a system of justice that is accountable and independent and administered by officers in a prompt, fair, efficient, and effective manner. Your leadership, the opening of the new law year gives the holder of the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs the opportunity to address the judiciary and members of the bar, the legal fraternity, on the administration of justice in our country. On March 13, 2017, your leadership would recall that along with His Excellency, the Governor General, we participated in the cutting of the ribbon to open the new Second High Court Chamber here at Judicial Complex in St. Kitts. It led to the appointment of the division born Madam Justice Pauletta Lance as a second High Court judge to the St. Kitts Circuit. The advent of the second court chamber and the appointment of a second judge here in St. Kitts has been in keeping with the court's mission to provide greater access and a more efficient and effective delivery of justice to our country. And we believe that this has had some success over the past um, year and a half. It has led to a significant reduction in the backlog of cases. There is no longer criminal assizes scheduled three times a year in the Senkis circuit, as there is now the continuous hearing of matters. When in September 2015, we had had the opening of the new law year that year, it would have been noted that in the mayor sizes of that year, we had completed some four matters, and that 32 matters were traversed from those mayor sizes, and an additional 16 new matters were added. Today, in September 2018, we can say that there have been some 
32 matters disposed of this year to date, and that there are now some 27 pending, of which 10 have just recently been filed. So there has been a significant improvement in what we consider access to justice and the delivery of justice in our country. We aim to continue to work to be more efficient. In March of this year, the National Assembly passed an amendment to the Magistrates Code of Procedure to initiate paper committals to replace the system of preliminary inquiries, PIs. As we speak, the Director of Public Prosecutions has been engaged in meetings with judicial officers, the magistrates, with the bar and the business community at the Chamber of Commerce building, with the police high command and other police officers responsible for court work. Before the paper committal process is operationalized, I'm advised, and that is with the gazetting of the order to this effect, I'm advised by the DPP that he would want to meet and respond to a request by some other members of the bar who had not attended before for further engagement. It is expected that the new system will come into force shortly, thus giving greater access to justice and hopefully making the criminal justice system here in St. Kitts and Nevis more efficient. The office of the, B of the DPP has been strengthened over the past year as we envisage an increase in the workload and respond to the concerns of our community, especially to the incidents of crime. We expect that during the next coming weeks, we'll also add another senior Crown Counsel to that office, and which will strengthen the ranks of the DPP's office. I would want your leadership at this time to publicly acknowledge the work done by Madam Justice Pauletta Lance as High Court Judge here in St. Kitts as she demits office, to thank her for her work to the court and to St. Kitts and Nevis, and to wish her well in her retirement. I would, want, I would also want your leadership to welcome to St. Kitts and Nevis his Lordship, Mr. Justice Eddie Ventos, as he takes up his first assignment as High Court Judge here in St. Kitts. We'd hope that his work here would be productive and that the rule of law and the administration of justice here in St. Kitts will benefit for his presence among us as he works to deliver and work on the administration of justice. While we work to improve the conditions of our court building, I would want to record that our judges now have a lounge which affords them the environment, the opportunity to continue the work in a more comfortable setting. We would also want to record that work has been more or less completed in a recently created judge's library where books and other literature are being provided to assist in the performance of the work of our judges and judicial officers here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Your Ladyship, the Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs continues to work to support the process of court-connected mediation. We hope that with the support of the Regional Coordinator, Mr. Compton, who is a member of your office, that we would be able to facilitate the training of some 25 individuals to be certified by the court as mediators. Currently, we have had two mediators who have undertaken the brunt of the work in recent years. The prospective mediators who have shown an interest in this important service come from a wide core section of disciplines in our community. And so we hope that with their training, they can support uh, another initiative that you have had of making mediation a critical part of the delivery of justice here in St. Kitts and Nevis. My ministry has pledged financial assistance 
to defray the cost of training, um, which will, we hope, be concluded in October of this year. I would want to move to our summary court. Our summary court continues to deliver justice to ordinary folk in civil, traffic, domestic violence, maintenance, criminal and juvenile matters. Between January and September this year, some 3,879 matters were filed in districts A and B in St. Kitts, and some 2,551 matters were disposed of, which um, was quite commendable, given the fact that we only have four magistrates assigned to St. Kitts. We expect your leadership to eventually begin construction of an annex to this judicial complex next door, right in this compound, where a third magistrate's court chamber will be added to District A to do family, juvenile matters, and maybe traffic as well. The annex will be constructed in such a way to become the home of a mediation center, as well as provide for the long-awaited law library for practitioners that we hope will be forthcoming just now. Your leadership, the St. Kitts Nevis Legal Aid and Advice Center, also referred to as Legal Aid, is another department within the Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs. Legal Aid was opened in November 2005 with an aim to provide low-cost legal services and representation to persons of low income, which includes, among other things, to advise, assist, and represent the indigent. That aim still remains the same today. Since January 2016, ensuring that legal aid clinics are conducted regularly in rural areas has been one of the core mandates of my ministry. There are many services that are provided at legal aid. The legal services mainly are mainly in relation to civil matters and juvenile criminal matters. And these, if we wanted to um, identify these, would be maintenance of child and spousal um, matters, custody, accept, adoption, adoption, divorce, landlord and tenant matters, will successions, and another, others of that ilk. This year, the key focus of the legal aid is that of estate planning. We have found that there are many people of modest means who lose their loved ones, and they do not know what to do about the assets that are left behind. And so estate planning is not just for the wealthy, but also persons who have built some wealth do often think more about how to safeguard it. Good estate planning often means more to families with modest assets because they can least afford to lose them. And we will be having a legal aid forum um, on estate planning later this year. Your leadership, as I wind down um, in my comments, um, I would want to state that in the thought to provide increased access to and participation in legal aid services, visits to the rural communities um, have been as many as 25 for the year to date um, in the various communities around the island and we would hope to achieve as many as 30 by the close of this year. Um, I would want your leadership that to note that we continue to work on a draft of a Legal Aid Act, which we hope would expand the reach of the Legal Aid Clinic to do a whole range of other matters and we hope to be able to engage stakeholders before seeking cabinet approval for tabling in parliament by the end of this year. I would finally want to turn to the question of a land registry. All of the processes of, at the registry in St. Kitts dealing with land matters are done manually. It was inevitable, therefore, that there were inordinate delays in the registration of land and the issuing of certificates of title. And these delays have had a disastrous effect on the ease of doing business 
index here in St. Kitts. We embarked, therefore, in Parliament last year to arrange at a legal uh, act to disentangle the land registry from the High Court registry. And we have since then appointed a registrar of titles, a registrar of lands, who has been, has hit the ground running and has embarked on a number of different processes. Um, we know that there's quite a lot to be done we have to have had to and continue to add staffing and we need to have a new home for the land registry we had hoped to have had that opened at the um, building that formerly housed the inland Reg Re um, inland revenue office as they moved to new headquarters unfortunately we have had to abandon that, as that building was so much in disrepair that we have been advised that it could no longer house that. But we continue to search for a new home which would house that. The advent of the land registry, and in keeping with your comments about digitalization and technology in improving the delivery of matters when it comes to land, is one that we have been very concerned about in relation to all of our procedure, proce processes. The Registry of Lands, in addition to the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Legal Affairs, just in Legal Affairs, have recently returned from the Republic of China and Taiwan, where they have been, we have been offered and have entered into an agreement to access assistance from the Chinese to have us have a new digitalized land registry and to assist us in various aspects of delivering a more efficient and effective land registry system. In addition, we have had to establish a land registry committee comprising of representatives of various stakeholders involved in land management and land transactions here in St. Kitts and Nevis. There are a number of functions that this committee has embarked on to assist with the smooth transition towards an independent land registry, to ensure the necessary policy and legislative framework are developed to ensure lands are properly registered and managed, to oversee the implementation of a land management system for the land registry, and to ensure that a cadastral mapping system be implemented for the first time for the survey and demarcation of lands for registration in the land registry. The committee has met a few set, on a few occasions and discussed a wide range of matters, including the support of the Republic of China on Taiwan. And we hope that with the assistance that we'll be able to have a fully operational land registry before the end of this year. I would want, finally, your leadership to note that the the question of the Law Commission. We have had for many years the services of a consultant um, who was our Law Commissioner, and he has now demitted office at the end of last year. And we are now in the process of trying to rebuild our Law Commission with the appointment of a new Law Commissioner, and others will be added once we can get the wherewithal to do so. Um, this should happen over the next few weeks, and we would be hoping that the, with your good offices and that of the Judicial Legal Services Commission, that we can get your support to help us to build this very important um, role. I would want to mention that, um, that the Department of IP, Intellectual Property, has now been fully functional an IT digital process that has made the registration and efficiency of um, registering um, trademarks and patents more efficient and effective. Um, and we will continue to have techn technological advances play an important part 
over the next year in a number of areas to improve on the efficiency and effectiveness in the discharge of our obligation to our citizens in the form of the introduction, implementation, enhancement of local area networks and document management systems in a number of departments that fall under the Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs, as well as the Attorney General's Chambers. And on that note, Your Ladyship, I would want to wish you and the Justice of Appeal and the Court, the Judiciary in all, that and the members of the bar, the inner and utter bar, and all practitioners, that I would wish all a very productive and successful new law year. May it please you, Your Ladyship. Thank you kindly, Mr. Attorney. I now invite remarks by his honor, Mr. Renal Benjamin, Acting Senior Magistrate. Uh, brief remarks are now invited. Thank you. May it please your leadership. Permit me to accept the protocol that has already been established by the learned Attorney General. May it please your leadership, Justice of Appeal, Judges of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. 2017, 2018 was a momentous year for us in the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court because we commemorate the 50th and now 51st anniversary of the coming into being of the Supreme Court in its present form. I now pay homage to the present leadership of the court, who has been playing a very instrumental role in continuing the building process, in buttressing the foundation of our legal system. I must commend the leadership also for their collective efforts to collectively help to mold the OECS Supreme Court into the premier legal institution that it is today. And for sowing the seeds for the benefit of the next and successive generations in such an important juncture, in the marking of such an important milestone in our history. On behalf of the entire Magistrate Court, I am humbled to be given this opportunity and privilege to address this august body of persons here today. First, I would like to welcome Justice Eddie Ventos as a judge in the Supreme Court in this federation. But before I do so, I, it is a very special privilege to pay special tribute to Justice Pauletta Lambs on her retirement. Somebody asks Albert Einstein to tell what is his theory of relativity, what it was about. He explained in simple terms, you put your finger in boiling water, one minute will look like an hour. On the other hand, if you're sitting with your sweetheart or the person you love, one hour seems like a minute. Justice Lanz made a significant contribution to law. And her time with us was too short. And there is a sense of sadness in seeing an important chapter of our sojourn on the bench come to an end. But that is mixed with the pride we feel in honoring her as one of our own. Her name is synonymous with the entire legal system in all departments and jurisdictions where she has worked. The saying, 
Some are born great. Some achieve greatness. And some have greatness just upon them. There's a famous line from Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare, which still retains its original meaning today. Justice Lance was a classic example of what a judge should be. The inherent, inherent qualities she possesses have made her achieve greatness and great height. Justice Eliventos, you too will also achieve great height. It is an honor for me and a privilege to welcome you as a judge in the High Court. I have the utmost confidence that you are going to be a devoted servant of justice and a bold and caring leader committed to the proposition that every litigant's equal access to our court and the justice dispense is of paramount importance regardless of one position or station in life. As a judge of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, you have been given the opportunity to make a meaningful contribution to the law. I have the fullest confidence that you understand the responsibility and mandate you have been given to make a positive impact by a fair and efficient administration of justice in the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis. We in the Magistrate Court are relentless in our efforts to achieve and maintain excellence throughout the court system. My initial focus has been to center on the basics about our court operation, especially in regard to our supervision of the court, about our promptness, about our productivity, about taking a critical look at how we do business every day downstairs. It is necessary that we take a wide range in appraisal of our current processes and procedures to decide what is working well and what needs to be improved. While we will always celebrate and look and expand on the things that are doing well, we have already identified things that are not working well and are not working as they should. We will always try to put an end to the areas of our operation that tends to impede inefficiency. It tends to impede efficiency. And we would like to see the magistrate court continue to work at its optimum. And we will make the necessary changes in the way we do business and to ensure that we deliver justice and that we work at, as an, in an efficient manner. But to do so, we need the support of all. If we are to succeed, we need the support of the judges, the court administrators, the lawyers, the bar association, the government, and the litigants. For we'll never be able to achieve the excellence we so, the excellence we so desire to achieve without input from others. We need your input. We know that there are things that downstairs that you need to let us know. Please make your views known to us and be an active participant in our desire to achieve excellence. Call on us. Write us. No suggestion for betterment is too large or too insignificant. In closing, let me express my heartfelt gratitude to the Learned Registrar, Registrar for giving me an opportunity to speak. We downstairs are energized by the challenges before us and the magnitude of the opportunity we have been given to serve. On behalf of my colleagues and staff of the Magistrate Court, let me assure you that every litigant who appears before the Magistrate Court will always receive a fair and impartial hearing. We will endeavor to continue to work tirelessly and conscientiously to apply the law with integrity and common sense. And as we strive to, read, to do what is right and to do what is just, we we tend to, to serve every parties that come before it who are seeking justice. May it please you. Thank you, Mr. Benjamin, for your kind remarks. I invite 
the Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Volston Graham, to bring brief remarks. May it so please you, Madam Chief Justice. Madam Chief Justice, can you permit me to adopt the protocol that has already been established? I'm grateful. M might I say, Madam Chief Justice, as unlike the acting senior magistrate, I, I do not come with any pocket full of, gre of greatness to be stowed. Um, he took all, and he spoke before me. But what I do come with, Madam Chief Justice, is to say to the court that, first of all, I want to be able to thank the court for its leadership that it continues to provide, and to say, Madam Chief Justice, you have quite effectively linked your, your last message, which I believe was in 2016, that, that dealt with access to justice, to, to this year's current team, challenges, opportunities, and resilience. And, and I must say, you could not have done a better job at all. You certainly did. Um, because in 2016, Madam Chief Justice, I, I, I was in New Kid and the Block. In fact, there, there, there were others that came around at the same time, but I can only refer to myself as in New Kid and the Block then. I came in at this, the very, this week, Madam Chief Justice makes two years since I've been the, the Director of Public Prosecutions in the Federation. I have seen some of the challenges. The Honorable Attorney General referred to the, the list that existed um, prior to my coming into office. I'm, I'm happy to report, Madam Chief Justice, that, that that backlog is very much a thing of the past. And that, in fact, we have been able to completely eliminate that backlog. And, in fact, I can proudly say that of the current cases that are before the court, with the exception of two cases, one currently before the Nevis circuit and one before the St. Kitts circuit, they, they would have all been transferred to the High Court either in late 2017 or sometime during this year. It brings me to one of the challenges that perhaps we are likely or we will face going forward. The Honorable Attorney General referred to the passage of the Amendment Number 4 of 2018, which repeals Part 4 of the Magistrate Court of Procedure Act, repeals the old preliminary inquiries um, method of transferring matters indictment matters to the High Court and introduces that with paper committal. Might I say, first of all, Madam Chief Justice, that during my presentations during the past few weeks, I, I, I sense quite a bit of excitement, enthusiasm, and, and hope for the system in light of, of this recent amendment. But one of the things I said at my presentations, Madam Chief Justice, which I would like to repeat is this. And I'm on record of saying, legislative reform, no matter how good or well intended it may be, cannot guarantee an efficient system. It requires the, the human element and the contribution of the, the, the respective individuals to ensure that efficiency is obtained. So with the passage of that act, Madam Chief Justice, and I'm pleased to hear the Attorney General has promised me, did he say three or four more councils? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. I, I know my hearing was quite right. Yes. I, I am quite to hear he recognized the need, and I'm, I'm grateful to him for the, the staff, the additional staff that we receive, and, and for the, the additional staff that we will receive. Because the implementation of the paper committal proceedings puts greater pressure on my office. It is as simple as that. Um, the, criminal, the paper committed proceedings are being instituted by the Director of Public Prosecutions. They are designed to improve the efficiency of the, of the court and in terms of transfer of indictment matters to the High Court. We would not serve the purpose, Madam Chief Justice, if we eliminate the backlog in the magistrate court just to bring it up and land it in Justice, His Lordship Justice Ward's lap or His Ladyship Justice Williams's lap. It simply means then that, and I have said to the Commissioner of Police and, and his senior officers and rank and file, I am expecting to see more efficient, comprehensive, and, and aggressive pursuit of completion of investigations. That that way the files can be with me 
in a reasonable time so that I can have them before the magistrate court for their onward transmission. So, so with, with the change in procedure, Madam Chief Justice, it does bring with it its challenges, but that is in keeping with, with the team that you have set for us. I, I am pleased, Madam Chief Justice, at, at the recently concluded sim joint symposium over the weekend. And again, you've, you've mentioned this morning of the introduction of sentencing guidelines. And, and can I report that since the, we, we met at the law fair, sorry, at the symposium, your, your office has dispatched with urgency the, the first five draft of those, those guidelines for the consideration and input of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, so I have with me the director in, in relation to robbery, rape, theft, drug offenses, and sexual offenses, which my undertaking is to ensure that they're distributed to my staff, distributed as wide as possible for, for much input from members of the, of the bar and community, and to play a role into assisting the advisory committee in to ensure that we have sentencing guidelines which are, are way and well overdue but, but which, nonetheless, we are on our way to see reality. You've made mention, Madam Chief Justice, of the challenges that was posed to the, to the various um, jurisdictions following the passages of Hurricanes Irma and Hurricane Maria. And, and I can speak personally for, for the devastation that was caused in my other home, the British Virgin Islands. Yes, my other home. Sink has been my, my, one of my homes as well. But I can speak personally for the damages that was inflicted there. And then in fact, I was in the, the UK at the time of the passage of Hurricane Irma. And when I was sent photographs and video footages from the British Virgin Islands, I dare say it put my 20 odd years of living there into non-existence. I could recognize no way. It, it, it was simply that bad. But in my recent visit there, I have been able to recognize that there has been significant improvements, both to overall infrastructure, um, the, the, the spirit and, and the motivation and desire and resilience of the people, but, but also in terms of the, the, the court facilities. There, there has been a, a new magistrate court um, constructed, albeit temporary. I, I must say it looked much more modern and more efficient than the existing structure that, that preceded it, certainly of, of the highest order. And I'm aware that the High Court as well has, has, has recommend since then its sitting. It shows, in keeping with your team, Madam Chief Justice, that even though challenges do come, it, it does present opportunities for, for, for us to improve, and it, it does demonstrate and reflect the, the resilience of our people and the people within the judiciary. Madam Chief Justice, in, in closing, might I extend my sincere appreciation, uh, first of all, to members of the, the defense uh, bar, uh, my, my learned friend Dr. Brown, being be, um, the, the chief culprit of, of among them. Um, he, he and I, as, as his Lordship Justice Ward and, and all the district Justice Williams quite well know, we tend to rumble from time to time. But, but it, it is done with a spirit of competitiveness, but also with a spirit of corporateness. Um, we, we can call on, on, the, on him and the other members of the, of the bar at, at any time. They, they, they have competitively, but cooperatively work together to ensure that the work of the, of the court is, is achieved. So I want to place on record my thanks and appreciation for them. I also want to place on record my appreciation and thanks to the registrar and staff of the High Court, the, the Commissioner of Police and his men, with, with whom I work quite closely on a daily basis, the, the her, members of our magistrate's prison, and I also want Madam Foreman, sorry, I also want Madam Chief Justice. I'm, I'm already in trial mode, my lady. Yes. Can, can, can't wait for the, for the, um, the, the, year, the year to begin. Can, can I also please, um, on record, my appreciation and thanks to His Lordship uh, Justice Ward, or Lordship Justice Williams, for, for their fair and balanced manner in which they have laid the court and, and the excellent leadership that they continue to provide. I suspect now that our matters will be coming up more rapidly, that we will be under a lot more pressure, Henry. Yes, we shall be. Uh, last but not least, Madam Chief Justice, may I pay respect and appreciation to my staff, without whom the, the work of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution will not be able to be accomplished. 
I want to thank them for their hard work. I want to thank them for their commitment. And I want to ensure them that for the year going forward, there will be a lot more work to come. <laughs> May so please you, Madam Chief Justice. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grimm, for those remarks. I now invite uh, Mr. Thaddeus Antoine, President of the OECS Bar Association, to bring brief remarks. May it please you, Lee, Justice of Appeal, Resident High Court Judges, Honorable Attorney General, Director of Public Prosecution, members of the inner bar, members of the bar, invited guests, court staff. This year, the OECS Bar Association celebrated 15 years of its regional law conference. The law fair, as it then was called, was conceived and was the brainchild of our first and only female president to date in Ms. Nicole Sylvester of blessed memory. It was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2004. We have, on this 15th anniversary, named a conference scholarship and grant in the name of Ms. Sylvester for lawyers up to five years of practice to attend a law conference with the expenses being defrayed by the Nicole Sylvester Memorial Scholarship Grant. As we believe continuing legal education is the bedrock to legal development. My lady, from 2004, the law conference has coincided with the opening of the law year. This affords our colleagues to visit a different island, some for the very first time, to experience the unique tourism product and lifestyle. It gives us a great appreciation of our brothers and sisters. Undoubtedly, it brings us closer together, and this year, being in the beautiful island of the Federation of St. Kitts Nevis, surpassed our expectations, with over 120 participants at the Park Hyatt being the largest to date. The OECS Bar has consistently rallied lawyers throughout the sub-region and beyond to engage in continuing legal education, lifting the standards of members by the terms and conditions for the judiciary and ultimately quality of service to the public. The annual conference provides a critical platform to discuss and debate topics of relevance in multifaceted areas of law, to interface meaningfully with the judiciary, to keep abreast of the latest legal publications. This year, our theme was the transforming influence of technology on the law. We thought this was the most applicable theme, as we recognize that technology has so far assisted us in improving the delivery of justice. But we are also acutely aware that like any use of any evolving thing, if we are not trained and sensitized as to its proper use, we stand to lose out or rather left behind. We at the OECS bar are not prepared to have any lawyer left behind. And as such, we're going to continue to provide a platform to educate our members and we welcome any move by the court, or indeed you, Chief Justice, to make continuing legal education mandatory for all lawyers, as we believe that it is in the interest of all lawyers, the justice system, and more importantly, the public. I continue to hold the opinion that this is an exciting time for lawyers, and the challenges and influences of technology in this global village of ours requires creativity, rigor, and our best minds so that we grasp the opportunities and be resilient. This was brought to the fore in a presentation by Justice Sipad, High Court Judge of Trinidad and Vigo, who aptly recognized that the legislative agendas in our region were not aggressive towards meeting the ever-changing evolution being brought about by technology, and in particular, social media. We need new laws to deal with issues of social media, such as privacy and defamation. But while we wait, it is recognized that our best minds have to be creative with causes of action in finding ways to bring those matters before the court. And the court, in turn, must be responsive in finding ways, as he puts it, to massage the principles of our existing laws to meet the expectations of the public so that justice can be done. The impact of social media, hiding behind fake names, injuring people's reputation, should not be tolerated notwithstanding the absence of relevant and cohesive legislation. The 
courts must intervene with what I call judicial progressiveness. However, when the courts do intervene, we as lawyers have to be responsible in the way we criticize any judgments, and indeed, the judge. We are not the general public. We can't be seen to be engaged in open criticism of any judgment, and indeed, the judge. The best response to what we deem a bad or wrong judgment is to appeal the decision. There are processes, and we must make use of such processes, and I implore my members to do so. The OECS bar calls on the governments to truly agree on and put in place harmonized legislation in the subregion. The actions of our respective governments, though totally within their rights of individually amending harmonized legislation for the region, is going against the very reason that it was being harmonized. That is to ensure that we have common legislation in the region, in a common market, so have to have common legal interpretations and applicability, and to have common court judgments. In that respect, we call on the governments of the region who are considering the move to the Caribbean Court of Justice to do so and block, so as not to have different approaches by the courts of legal issues in our region. I submit that all our jurisdictions have not fully embraced the CCG, simply because of a lack of trust and confidence in our own people. Our very own OECS Court of Appeal has turned out many a judgment that, has been, have, that have been upheld by the Privy Council. Likewise, the CCG continues to make strides and contribute to a solid Caribbean jurisprudence. I can continue to be of the opinion that a change of narrative is needed for the discussions. It can't primarily be about the linking from the Privy Council to read ourselves of our colonial past. It should be about access to justice. This should be the new judicial and political narrative for the linking from the Privy Council in favor of the Caribbean Court of Justice. While our Court of Appeal is doing an excellent job in providing access to justice for the people of the region, we seem to be shortchanging our people in our region when litigants are simply not able to appeal from the Court of Appeal to the Privy Council at the, as the cost is prohibitive for the majority of our, of our litigants. Then there, there leaves little or no opportunity for the judgments of our Court of Appeal to be reviewed by a higher court if a litigant is dissatisfied. This essentially makes our Court of Appeal our de facto final appeal court. This, I submit, is not good for justice. This is not good for the development of our jurisprudence. This is simply not good for access to justice. Our people of our region are essentially being denied the right to get a second opinion in their matters. We at OECS Bar are willing, ready, and able to help to educate the populace to bring this injustice to an end. The OECS Bar would once again would like to thank the Chief Justice and her team for including the OECS Bar and indeed the constituent bars in the celebration of his 50th anniversary of the court. We maintain that we have every reason to be even more optimistic about the next 50 years. And without being repetitive, we note the continuing progressive initiatives of the court to meet the challenges. Embracing technology, video link for hearing and e-payments, establishing specialized courts for commercial, sexual offenses and family matters, streamlining and harmonizing our criminal procedure rules and now our probate rules, pursuing ongoing continuing judicial education, seeking to make e-filing a permanent reality throughout the OECS. Only this week, we, present, we were presented with a new sentencing guidance project so as to prevent what my lady described as uninformed comments on sentencing, so as to promote the rule of law and promote transparency. We are happy to hear that the sentencing guidance is about uniformity of structure and not uniformity of sentencing and thus the judge's discretion is not fettered. However, we continue to bring to the court's attention, and in fact, we join the court for the urgent redress, the timely and efficient production of trial transcripts, the timely delivery of judgments by all our judges. We are aware that insufficient resources to provide better technology to convert real-time audio into text, to provide judges with legal clerks to assist with their research, all hinders the delivery of justice to the public. We once again call on our respective governments to give the, judici the judiciary the priority it deserves. We renew our call for greater injection of resources into the administration of justice. Very importantly, we continue our repeated calls for creation of suitable halls of justice in each jurisdiction. We continue our repeated calls for setting up a trust fund 
the same way one was done for the Caribbean Court of Justice, to allow the court to independently manage its operations and affairs for a better administration of justice, as they should not be at the beg and call of any government. Milady, I am getting alarmingly concerned about the health of the bar, the health of our lawyers, our physical and mental health. I recognize that we have to get a serious health campaign going among our members to appreciate that we must endeavor to have good physical and mental health, to ensure the proper delivery of our services, the overweight, the depression, the excessive, the excessive smoking, the excessive drinking, all have to be addressed. There is no doubt that being a lawyer is stressful. The public looks up to us, and we are acutely aware of it. And as such, we often mask our issues. But we must be able to talk to someone to seek professional help, to ensure that we serve our clients at our very best, but also live a quality and longer life with our loved ones. We are going to explore and discuss with each bar the getting on board of professional help to assist our colleagues to deal with the rigors and vigories of practice. We have to be honest with ourselves and for us to get help, the right help. Milady, in closing, with your leave, I would like to thank the following. Ms. Jean Dyer of the Anguilla Bar, our law conference coordinator, for her continued excellent work in bringing all the elements together for law conference. Ms. Delia Rowe Joseph, president of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar, and indeed the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association, for hosting and facilitating the law conference and the enjoyable social activities that complemented the conference. My executive of the OECS Bar and members of the constituent bars for their continued trust and confidence as we move along to carry out the work of the OECS Bar. I pledge to continue working, with, working closely with the executive of the OECS Bar and the constituent bars for working conditions and continuing education. Working with the OECS Commission, the Central Bank, and other institutions to advance the causes of the region. And working closely with the judiciary to continue advancing for better salaries, terms, and conditions for our judges and judicial, judicial officers as they work to improve administration of justice for all. For all our colleagues, attorney generals, directors of public prosecutions, magistrates, registrars, judges, judicial officers, and other invited guests who attended the 15th annual law conference of the OECS Bar, I say thank you and hope to see you and more in Antigua and Barbuda for the 16th Regional Law Conference. Happy independence to the government and people of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Antoine. Ms. Delia Joseph Rowe, President of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association, will now address us on behalf of the association. May it please the court, your ladyship, I respectfully request to adopt the protocol that has been ably established. It is indeed an honor for me to rise to address the court on this special occasion on behalf of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association. I extend the warmest welcome to you, Madam Chief Justice, and to the Justices of Appeal to the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. And I wish the court a successful sitting. Your Ladyship, please permit me to especially welcome the Honorable Justice Eddie Ventos to the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis as the resident judge. May his Lordship's time on the bench in the jurisdiction be rewarding and fulfilling. As a bar, we pledge to assist his Lordship in any way possible as we recognize the critical importance of the bench and the bar working together to further the administration of justice. While Madam Justice Lance is not present in court today, I would wish to put on record our deep appreciation for the dedicated service of Madam Justice Lance in <coughs> St. Kitts and Nevis. We hope to honor Madam Justice Lance in a, and her invaluable contribution in an appropriate way before too long. A more appropriate theme could not have been selected for this year's opening of the law year. Challenges, opportunities, and resilience, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court paving the way to modern and efficient judiciary for the Eastern Caribbean. The theme is brimming with optimism and pledges the court's commitment to improving the administration of justice. And with that approach, 
the future of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court is indeed promising. We recognize the role of the bar in the proper administration of justice. As officers of the court, we recognize our duty to assist the court as far as possible. That means preparing our cases diligently so that we may direct the court to the applicable principles of law. It also means being true to our word and being trustworthy in our representations to the court. What it does not mean is doing anything to win our cases at all costs. While we do have an obligation to our clients to give him or her the best legal representation possible, as officers of, of the court, our first duty is to the proper administration of justice. I wish to pause here to also state the importance of the interaction among members of the bar in the administration of justice. I have had occasion to hear the judge, judge's comment on too many occasions, actually, that lawyers do not speak to each other in the context to mean that the case could have progressed more efficiently had lawyers simply discussed certain matters in advance of a hearing, in, which, in, which, in respect of which there was no need to trouble the court. As lawyers, we ought to recognize that we play a role in the level of efficiency of, of the court. If there are preliminary matters in respect of which counsel can reach an agreement, we ought to reach out to opposing counsel in an effort to arrive at an agreed position so that the court may proceed to deal with other matters in respect of our cases. There's also the matter of the conduct of attorneys at law in court. I urge members of the bar to be courteous to each other and always be courteous and respectful to the court even when decisions are made that are not in our favor. There are legal avenues to address adverse decisions and they ought to be utilized. We can be passionate about our client's case, but we can be passionate while being respectful. I also wish to address the role of senior lawyers in upholding the administration of justice. Young lawyers take their cue from more senior members of the bar from the way senior lawyers are attired in court to attend court to the way senior lawyers address the court and the way senior lawyers are, uh, present their client's case to the court. I urge senior members of the bar to be mindful of this, be mindful that your juniors are looking on and learning from you so that you may conduct yourselves accordingly. I would also like to take this opportunity to urge senior members of the bar to take up leadership roles in the bar association. With respect, being, in my view, being a member of the inner bar ought not to be a matter of ticking off the boxes in respect of the criteria to be granted silk, and that is the end of it. In my view, there is an ongoing obligation on Queen's Council and other senior members of the bar to lead, teach, and guide. Last weekend, we were fortunate to have hosted the 15th annual um, OECS Bar Association Regional Law Conference, where the theme was transforming influence of technology on the law. We had 47 delegates of, um, present from St. Kitts and Nevis, of which we are very proud, as we tied for the most delegates of any host jurisdiction ever, we've tied with Grenada. I mention the law conference because its theme is in line with the court's pledge to make the court more modern and efficient, and members of the bar and bench participated actively in the weekend's activities. While we would welcome the increased use of technology and modernization of our court system, we recognize the role the government plays in ensuring the vision of the court materializes. I am heartened that the Honorable Governor um, Attorney General and Minister of Justice and Legal Affairs, from all discussions with him, appears to be fully committed to making the court's vision a reality. While some persons hold the view that the court does not bring votes to politicians, that kind of thinking is myopic and unfortunate. If an efficient court system is not in place, investors would think twice before investing in the island, and the economic growth of the island can be negatively impacted as a result. 
Apart from the economic benefits of a well-run court system, there's a critical role of the court in the protection of the democracy that we hold so dear. The very politician who may not see it as important to invest in the court because it does not win him votes will be the first at the doorstep of the court the moment that he feels that his legal rights have been infringed upon. How can he get justice if the proper systems are not in place to ensure the efficient running of the court? Also, how many of our people that are indigent and vulnerable turn to the court to seek redress for the wrongs done to them and to get justice? I implore that we not, own, that we not take the critical role of the court for granted. It is perhaps the single most important institution in a de democratic society. I wish to recognize the recent work of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis to improve the administration of justice in the Federation. Of note, we saw the separation of the land registry from the High Court registry and the appointment of a new registrar of lands. This has no doubt significantly reduced the workload of the High Court registrar, who also carried the function of the registrar of lands, and therefore ought to increase the efficiency in the operation of the High Court Registry. We have also seen the launch of the program to digitize the records in the land registry with the assistance of the Taiwanese, develop Taiwanese government, which is a welcome development. The Honorable Attorney General has also advised that he has set in train the process towards digitizing the laws of St. Christopher and Nevis. The importance of that project cannot be overstated. The last compilation of the laws of St. Kitts and Nevis is now nine years old. The last revised laws having been published in 2009. So there are nine years of laws in respect of which practitioners are required to troll through copies of the Gazette to obtain a copy or rely on the staff of the Attorney General's chambers or the legal department in Nevis to provide or advise on whether there have been any amendments to the laws. Members of the bar would welcome the laws of St. Kitts and Nevis being made available electronically and the electronic database being updated regularly, as this would significantly improve the efficiency and quality of the service we provide to our clients. It is good to modernize our systems but we cannot forget that there's also a need to invest heavily in our human resources. The importance of providing ongoing training to members of the court staff cannot be overstated. And I would encourage the government to continue to invest in the human resources that form a part of the court machinery. There is no question that mediation is an invaluable tool in the civil litigation process and can assist greatly to resolve matters quickly. However, in St. Kitts and Nevis, with an inadequate number of trained court-connected mediators, at times mediation actually slows down the process as court matters, um, so slows down the process, progress of court matters due to the, in large part, to the unavailability of the few court-appointed mediators that we have, so that the time frame ordered by the court for mediation has to be extended sometimes several times. This has been the state of affairs in the Federation for quite some time, and we would welcome the appointment of additional court-connected mediators on the roster. I was heartened by the Honorable Attorney General's statement today indicating his commitment to provide support to train additional court-connected mediators by October of this year. I wish to commend the court on the new criminal sentencing guidelines project and the court's initiative to hold a session on the new guidelines at last weekend's conference. I also wish to express appreciation to the court, to the approach of the court, having a dedicated email address to deal with queries or concerns that practitioners may have in respect to the new the proposed new sentencing guidelines, a demonstration of the court's commitment to improving the administration of justice in the Eastern Caribbean. I wish to close by stating that as members of the bar, we look forward to a new law year with positivity 
and pledged to work with the court in the furtherance of the administration of justice in St. Christopher and Nevis. May God bless the members of the judiciary, the members of the legal profession, and all those involved in one way or the other in the administration of justice in the Federation. May the court have a, may the court have a fruitful law year 2018-2019. May it please your ladyship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Joseph Rowe. I now invite remarks by Dr. Henry Brown, Queen's Counsel. Madam Chief Justice, I know he did not say brief, but I will be brief. <laughs> Madam Chief Justice and other honorable justices of appeal, honorable judges of first instance court, and I also welcome Justice Pentos. In time, you'll get your full measure. Deputy Governor General, Honorable Attorney General, Distinguished Solicitor General, hereafter I apply to adopt the protocol already established. There being no objection, I think my application is denied. Milady, this is one day after St. Christopher and Nevis celebrated our Heroes Day when we pay tribute to our great heroes who initiated and endured so much to secure our political independence for St. Christopher and Nevis. Tomorrow, we celebrate Independence Day. St. Christopher and Nevis, popularly abridged St. Kitts and Nevis, became a sovereign democratic state within the Commonwealth of Nations on 19 September 1983. It is on that day, by and large, our present constitution was ushered into play. I say by and large because, as you know, the operation of our present constitution was subject to the transitional provisions set out in Schedule II to the St. Christopher Nevis Constitution Order, 1983, which itself was made at the Court of Buckingham Palace on 22nd June, 1983, and came into operation on the 23rd of June, 1983. Constraints on time do not allow me to go through the transitional provisions just referred to. And further, for present purposes, they are not intimately <coughs> germane. The Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis is uniquely structured in terms of the two orders or units of the Federation, the structure does not accord with what is the accustomed configuration of constitutions of federal states. In time, much no doubt would be said about this. Meanwhile, it is probably appropriate, given the nature of these proceedings, to do some reflection. It is not insignificant that Section 1 of the Constitution establishes St. Kitts and Nevis as a sovereign democratic state. St. Christopher and Nevis is a parliamentary democracy based on the Westminster model. Hands in the Queen. Chapter 1 of the Constitution, Chapter 9 of the Constitution, forgives me, deals with the judiciary, the third department of government. Distinct from the legislature and the executive, the other two departments of government, the Constitution wholly entrusts to the High Court unlimited jurisdiction in criminal and civil proceedings under any law. The High Court has a supervisory jurisdiction over all inferior courts for the purpose of ensuring that justice is duly administered. The Constitution provides for the interpretation of the Constitution and the enforcement of fundamental rights, including the right to protection of the law. The Constitution entrenches the separation of powers between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. One branch or department of government may not safely trespass upon the province of the other. 
in a unanimous decision of the Privy Council, Lord Bingham of Cornwall, in Director of Public Prosecutions in Morrison, 2003, two appeal cases, 411, examined the separation of powers under the Westminster Constitution. In speaking to the like Constitution of Jamaica, he said, quote, whatever overlap there may be under constitutions of the Westminster model between the exercise of the executive and, the le and legislative powers, the separation between the exercise of judicial power on the one hand and legislative and executive power on the other is total or effectively so. Such, unquote, such separation based on the rule of law was recently described by Lord Stain as a characteristic feature of democracies. In the discharge of its judicial functions, the judiciary strive to live up to its mission statement. Madam Chief Justice, an independent judiciary demands equality before the law. But the judiciary, to be truly independent, it must be comprised of scholars with an acquisitive and inquiring mind. A judge must be intellectually curious with the backbone, the strength of steel. The litigant must feel he had a fair hearing even when things did not go well for him. In the equal dispensation of justice, the judge's personal beliefs and idiosyncrasies should not bend the arc of justice in a particular direction. Justice is to be informed by law and precedent. These are aspirational norms we hear ever so often. Nevertheless, they remain relevant in the people's everyday access to justice. Justice, however, cannot be effectively administered in incommodious surroundings with seriously limited resources. Justice cannot be effectively administered when the purse strings are totally controlled by the executive for whom the courts do not seem to be a priority in the scheme of things. Justice cannot be effectively administered when decisions and or judgments are not forthcoming timelessly. This last observation is becoming a serious complaint by those who have to access the courts. But how can decisions or judgments be handed down timelessly in the context of what exists in St. Christopher and Nevis? Madam Chief Justice, our judges and administrative staff which support them work beyond the call of duty. They are all overworked. You are all overworked and grossly underpaid. <laughs> it is time to consider maybe the, qualified, the appointments of qualified judicial assistants to judges of all our courts in this jurisdiction. The reason and purpose for that is self-evident and does not need an essay to establish the relevance and importance of that point. I hope this need reaches the minds of the executive who controls the purse strings. Year after year, we come to the opening of the law year and hear about or soon to be built a wonderful and judicial and legal complex described as halls of justice with state-of-the-art facilities. I hope when we meet next year, we will be operating out of the new complex with all or most of the so-called state-of-the-art facilities. Madam Chief Justice, Her Majesty's Judicial Committee of the Prison Council is our final court of appeal.
which sits at number nine Downing Street in London, England. Soon, our neighbor, Antigua and Barbuda, will go to referendum to determine if the Caribbean Court of Justice, which sits in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, should replace Her Majesty's Privy Council as our final court of appeal. This decision by the people of Antigua and Barbuda, whatever the result, would be momentous. The debate surrounding this issue seems to be raging in Antigua and Barbuda. I do not propose at this stage to engage in it from here. In any event, there is hardly anything I can usefully add to the debate in Antigua and Barbuda. I suspect, however, that when that debate reaches here, it would be incumbent on in me to say something about it, one way or the other. Despite what I just said, I hold the view that a true referendum, void of ambiguities, contradictions, and confusion, should ask an uncomplicated, simple question which admits of one answer, yes or no. I pass on. Madam Chief Justice, in this year of our independence, there is again call for constitution reform in St. Kitts and Nevis. The constitution of St. Christopher and Nevis is indeed unique. It is fashioned out of a political climate overriding purpose then, from a strictly political point of view, was to keep the two islands of St. Kitts and Nevis inextricably linked. But in doing so, and to avoid the potential secession of Nevis from the unitary state of St. Kitts and Nevis, the Constitution framers, with the ultimate approval of the people's representatives in the then House of Assembly, created two orders of government, a government for Nevis and a government for St. Kitts and Nevis, with a common head of state. St. Kitts, pre St. Kitts, is yet to have a government of its own. This was an experiment aimed at eschewing the breakaway of Nevis from St. Kitts, bearing in mind that up until 1980, Anguilla was formerly part of the unitary state of St. Kitts and Nevis and Anguilla. Anguilla successfully, in de facto fashion, broke away from the unitary state on the 10th June 1967. As it stands today, Nevis can decently and formally break away from this unique federation. This is a constitutional option provided for in section 113 of the Constitution, which provides the Nevis Island Legislature may provide, may provide that the island of Nevis shall cease to be federated with the island of St. Christopher, and accordingly, that this Constitution shall no longer have effect in the island of Nevis. Political scientists and pundits bemoan the fact that St. Kitts is joined at the hip of Nevis. Although the people of Nevis can properly decide to separate itself from St. Kitts, the people of St. Kitts have no such lawful option. The vision born as I am, and proud, and as a constitutionalist, I hold another view, and such is open to debate, and possibly consideration in any political or constitutional reform. Section 113 should be looked at in the context of a comprehensive review of the Constitution. In, in Section 113 of the Constitution, a sanctioned recipe for disunity between St. Kitts and Nevis, this is a matter for discussion and decision which could possibly reach our courts. Crime. I turn now briefly to the question of crime. I'll be brief. Crime stalks the land. Coming up hard against crime is the fundamental rights, are the fundamental rights 
of those charged with crime. Nowadays, cybercrime is a phenomenon which the framers of the Constitution did not and could not have had in their contemplation 35 years ago when the Bill of Rights described as fundamental rights were doubly entrenched in our Constitution. The law of evidence was not developed by our courts or supplemented by legis en legislative enactments to take account of transnational crimes wire frauds, and crimes committed through the cyber networks. Internet defamation was unheard of 35 years ago. Today, internet defamation is a new fad, a new fashion. By the click of a mouse, one's hitherto unblemished reputation can be destroyed worldwide. Snapchat. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter now rule the universe in as few characters as 120. These media are useful tools for the progress and upliftment of mankind. But side by side with these advantages are the pernicious and diabolical mischief for which they are employed. To stand in the way of such dangers, Law reform, constitutional law reform, needs to be addressed. Hard pressed in dealing with crime, the lawmakers seem to be at a loss. Hence the frequent need, they think, to pass mandatory minimum sentences and legislation deeming a defendant guilty axiomatically by the mere establishment of a single fact. Such legislation need to be carefully scrutinized to ensure peaceful coexistence with the Constitution. Legislation which completely removes any power in the judiciary to consider the question as to the minimum punishment for the commission of crime for which the parties before the court or any other individual is charged, however compelling, in their favor, the circumstances of their case might be, favors <coughs> or leans towards unconstitutionality. And when such occurs, it is the duty of the court to strike such legislation down if it is a post-constitutional law. When such colorable legislation is a pre-constitutional law, the course would be and remains in eclipse courts would be expected to read such law down with such modifications, exceptions, and qualifications as to bring it into conformity with the Constitution. To do this, the judiciary must be intellectually sound, erudite, bold, and independent. Such is the function of this co-equal branch of government working under uncomfortable auspices in dispensing justice to and for the people of our OECS region. We pray for the judiciary's good health as they severally and jointly continue to discharge their difficult tasks without fear or favor and malice towards none. We pray for them as they strive to fulfill the court's mission statement, that is to deliver to our Eastern Caribbean states and provide access to a system of justice that is accountable and independent and administered by officers in a prompt, fair, efficient, and effective manner. May it please you, Madam. Thank you very kindly, Dr. Brown. As this special sitting draws to an end, Her Ladyship the Honorable Justice Lorraine Williams will deliver closing remarks.
Thank you, Justice Trevor Ward. Madam Chief Justice, the protocol list has already been established, and I seek your leave to adopt it as presented. It is my pleasant duty to give the closing remarks to what has been an inspiring church service in Sumanet and a comprehensive, insightful, and impactful address by the Honorable Chief Justice, Dame Janice Ferreira. Thank you, Chief Justice, for your forthright and candid remarks. I am humbled to give these remarks before so many respected and distinguished persons and colleagues. The law year always provides an opportunity for all of us to reflect on our roles and aspirations and to regroup before the workload of the law year descends upon us. And so as we bring these proceedings to a close, I wish to, I want to start by welcoming my colleague, Justice Eddie Ventos, to the bench of St. Kitts and Nevis and to wish Justice Poulet lands a peaceful and blessed retirement. I want to thank our distinguished Chief Justice, Dame, Justice, Dame Janice Pereira, and the Honorable Justices of Appeal, and my colleagues at the High Court for their active engagement in today's proceedings at the Church Service and in our court proceedings this morning. To the Honorable Attorney General, Honorable Vincent Byron, I extend my gratitude to you for your presence here, and I thank you for your usual succinct and encouraging remarks on the status of the courts and registry and other legal affairs in St. Kitts and Nevis. I trust that you will also give equal attention and resources to the courts and the conditions of work in the registry in Nevis. To the members of the inner and utter bar, especially the speakers this morning, I thank each and every one of you for your sincere devotion to your duty as lawyers and for your deep concern and efforts to improve the quality of life of people in our country. To the Madam Registrar, Mrs. Janine Lake and her staff, you richly deserve our gratitude for your efficient and zealous efforts in the preparation of today's proceedings and for the work of the Court of Appeal in the days ahead. To the Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Graham and his officers, for your efforts, your efforts in maintaining the rule of law in St. Kitts and Nevis. To the police commissioner, Mr. Ian Creeley, and his officers and the of the police and prison service, thank you for your assistance, service, and protection. I am hopeful that 2018-2019 will be a year of progress, innovation, and cooperation in our quest to deliver justice to the people of the OECS and beyond. There will be challenges, but there will be opportunities, and we, bench and bar, and officers of the court must be resilient as we seek to pave the way to a modern and efficient judiciary for the people of the Eastern Caribbean. Happy Independence. Oh, before I say that, let us end with a prayer of thanks and praise to the Almighty God, the giver of life, for permitting us to come together to mark this annual event and for his continued protection, wisdom, and guidance on all of us and our families. Let me wish a happy independence to the government and people of St. Kitts and Nevis. And before we take the adjournment, please note that the Court of Appeal will commence their sitting at 2 p.m. in this court. Thank you very much.